Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Lord, to you, Lord now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to see his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, but I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. In September 1986, during the heights of the 1980s economic boom, and there are people here in this nave and watching online who were there and remember those times firsthand, when so many people got so wealthy so quickly. Fortune magazine published an article with the headline, Should You Leave It All to the Children? And already by that time, the famous investor from Nebraska, the Oracle of Omaha, Warren Buffett, was worth more than $1 billion. And already by that time, he had established his reputation
for having a very clear answer to that question, should you leave it all to your children? Buffett's answer was no. In a saying he would use throughout his career, Buffett said, the perfect amount of money to leave your children was enough so they felt they could do anything, but not so much that they could do nothing. And to her credit, Buffett's daughter, Susan, said that she agreed with her father's philosophy, but she admitted it could be frustrating. At that time, in the mid-1980s, she was an administrative assistant married to a public interest lawyer. So when it came time for them to remodel their kitchen, they needed more money than their incomes would provide. Not a large sum of money, not so much that they could go to the beach for six months and have a vacation, but just money to remodel their kitchen. Her billionaire father refused. In exasperation, Susan said, all my life my father has been teaching us this lesson. Well, I feel like I've learned it. At a certain point, you can stop. And the same was true for her brother, her brother, Peter Buffett. Peter Buffett is a musician, not a career known for a steady income. So there were times in his life when he had to put a double mortgage on his house just to produce his music shows. And once when he was in his 20s, he asked his father for a loan. Again, his billionaire father refused. In today's gospel reading, we see that the father of the prodigal son is really nothing like Warren Buffett. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that will belong to me. And the father divided his property between them. In English, we hear the word property twice, but these are two different words in Greek. The second word literally means life, bias where we get the word biology. Bios can also mean the means to support a life, so livelihood. So the father divided his livelihood between his two sons. But we know that a person's livelihood can go far beyond material goods. A livelihood can be how we give meaning and define our lives. To divide up our livelihood can mean giving up something very deep within ourselves. My aunt owned a cafe in Richmond, California. And when I was a child in the 1980s, my mother would drive me and my brother on Saturday mornings from our house in Marin County over the Richmond Bridge to the cafe so we could have breakfast there. It wasn't until I was older that I realized we'd really go there to have breakfast so that my mother could help her sister at the cafe. While my brother and I would have breakfast and play in the dining room, my mother would disappear to help in the kitchen. And when I was in college, I did the same thing. I spent a summer at the cafe working for my aunt, and I found the pace of work exhausting. I would arrive around 5.30 in the morning, but my aunt was already there, boiling endless numbers of potatoes or washing tomatoes or cooking huge sheets of bacon in the oven. And the cafe opened at 6.30, and she was a blur of activity, cooking, cleaning, washing dishes, making coffee drinks, running the cash register, and I could just do anything to help, help, help her and keep up. The cafe closed at three, and I could usually get home by four to drive back over the Richmond Bridge, but she would stay late until the evening to prepare for the next morning. And yet, even with this pace, she never seemed tired. And even though all day she was cooking and taking orders, she was also having conversations with all of her customers and remembering their names and their birthdays and asking after their children. These customers have been coming for years and they were her family, really, her community. And so when it was a time for my aunt to sell that cafe because she was too old, it wasn't just a business transaction. This was her livelihood. This was her life, her bios that she was selling. It was like giving up a piece of her soul. The prodigal son is unlike Warren Buffett in another way. Not only does the father give away his livelihood, but he provides no restrictions on how this inheritance should be used. 
Warren Buffett did eventually give enormous sums of money to his children, but not to them directly. It was to their philanthropic foundations for charity. But the prodigal's father makes an unrestricted gift. Why doesn't the father put guardrails in? Surely he knows what kind of person his younger son is. He knows his younger son's not going to use the money to buy a farm or raise a family or support a life of scholarship or art. The father must know he's going to waste the money. Yet he gives it to him anyway. The final difference, I think, between Warren Buffett and the prodigal's father is a common mistake that many investors make, throwing good money after bad. When I used to work on Wall Street trading derivatives for a Swiss bank, that was the first thing new traders would always do. They'd always sell their profitable investments too early and keep doubling down on losing investments. So we had to be trained to do the opposite. We had to be trained to cut our losses. But in the parable, after the younger son has proven how irresponsible he is, the father welcomes him back with a feast, with a fatted calf. This is an extraordinarily expensive decision. The fatted calf the father calls for is high-quality grain-fed beef. It is enough food to feed as many as 75 people much more than a single household can consume. This is a feast one might have once a year on the most holy religious day, like the Day of Atonement. Yet the father decides this is the moment when the younger son comes back home, having squandered his entire inheritance, maybe a third of the family fortune. Now the father wants to throw a feast not just for his own family, but for the entire village a public feast for the son who has caused public shame. It is clear that the father of the prodigal son is no Warren Buffett. That father really is a terrible investor. And if the father in the parable represents God, then we must conclude that God too is a terrible investor. God will never become a billionaire with these investment practices. So where is the good news in this? I think it's here. God is a terrible investor, and that is good news because we are all terrible investments. Yet God doesn't cut losses. God continually throws good money after bad. God doesn't refuse us when we ask, but God freely gives us the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation. And this gift comes from inside the very life of God, out of God's own bios, in the form of his Son, Jesus Christ. For no matter how often we travel to that faraway country and squander our inheritance, no matter how many times we go bankrupt financially, spiritually, maybe even morally, when we turn back to God, God will drop everything, run towards us, and welcome us home with an extravagant 